It was roll call again. We went out and talked, and they would also uh, have some guy could speak English. All of these good English-speaking people, they all got over to Germany in 1938, and they couldn't get back. There was must have been a half a dozen of them in our, our Germans in our camp that could do this. It all happened to them. They, they, they just couldn't get back. The real truth, they were only thought they'd be on the winning side, I think. Anyway, this went on, and then in late January, we noticed that we could see out to the road a lot of refugees were moving, huge columns of people moving. And one time, a group of POWs moved into camp, and they come from East Prussia. They marched all the way. See, Germany was divided by the Polish corridor, which uh, on the end of it, uh, the port was Danzig, the free, free port of Danzig, it was called. And it was a 10-mile strip of land so that Poland would have access to the sea. And of course, Hitler wanted that back, and the Polish wouldn't give it to him back, and that was one of the reasons that in uh, September 1939 why he invaded Poland. And he wanted that land back because it was dividing Germany. So East Prussia, the Russians were coming through. They said that uh, the, the Russians are getting close to East Prussia. And on uh, January 30th, uh, the super ship Wil uh, Wilhelm uh, Gustav left East Prussia. This is a super ship, one of the biggest ships that Germany had. It was a training school to train submarine man or mar minor mar mar sa sailors for submarines. There was 120 of them aboard, and the others was packed full of refugees trying to get away from the Russians. They figured there was over 10,000 of them on that ship. That ship got torpedoed by the Russians. The three tor torpedoes hit her. The decks was so cold that it was icy, and people tried climbing on the desk, decks. Some got in lifeboats. Some of them were picked up in the water. But over around 10,000 of them died, and that is considered to be one of the biggest uh, mar maritime disasters of all times. In fact, one of the ships that was full of refugees from this ship got torpedoed by the Russians and sank too. Some of them walked across the frozen part of the Baltic Sea. And I talked to a woman who is now in Arizona. She was one of the refugees that walked from, she was six years old, she walked from East Prussia all the way across to Denmark. In Denmark, she was put in a camp for three years. So then she came over to the United States. These are refugees all over the place. And everybody wants to get away from the, from the Russians, especially. So rumor comes around, and this prison camp is the rumors run wild, always rumors. And they had a guy that claims he would come every night and tell us the latest from BBC, British Broadcasting uh, System. Uh, he would come every night, and he said he got off the radio. Well, the Germans had loudspeakers in around the, ca the camp. It was in the compound, I should say, call them, because there were four compounds in this camp, and I was in a compound. My radio operator was also in a compound, so I could go and visit them in the daytime. But rumor is they we're going to move. We're going to move. So I decided that if we we're going to move, I better get something, some kind of a pack made. So I took an OD shirt and I sewed it up on the bottom. And the sleeves, I extended them so I could pull it over to my back and cross it and button it. And then I um, had a, made a belt to, uh, of the, and from another shirt. I, and so then the I sewed it up a ways on the bottom and then the rest I buttoned so I could put a, a blanket and some of my stuff that I, little I had I could put in there. See. So I'm working on this thing and the guard comes in and he sees me. He says, was is das? What is this? I says, gewecht. 
He says, go back I, on the Eisenbaum, the Iron Railroad. I says, Nix, Gavect, and I pointed to my feet. Gavect, yeah. No, no, no. And he grabbed that thing away from me, and he threw it under another bunk across the room. Okay. So he goes out, so I finish my job. And the belt buckle I still kept, it was made by a, a Russian prisoner. See, the Russian, Russians, uh, they would come around and they would, uh, with their honey buckets, and they'd pump the, 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 the toilets or the latrines, see? And so they would have a little contact with the prisoners is what they would. Yeah, this is it here. So this I had in my belt to hold the, uh, to, together. So anyway, comes uh, the afternoon of February 5th. He said, we're gonna move out tomorrow. So I get my pack all ready and in the morning comes roll call. So I put my pack on. And the guy says, what are you putting your pack on for? Well, I said, they're gonna move us out. No, he says, they won't move us out until noon. They never, they wouldn't do a thing. I said, I think what they're gonna do is they're gonna line us up, count us, and march us out. No, no, they would never do that, okay? So I still put my pack on. Guess what? All lined up, out we march. Oh, the guys were just sick because they, their real treasures were those, like diary books, oh, beautiful things. They left them behind. So we're, out we go. We're given a Red Cross parcel. Okay, march, we march out. By the railroad station, march away we go. So we march full day. We came across a, a, a water pump that was close to the road and they would let us take a, a hand pump and get some water to drink. That was very welcome. Anyway, they put us in the barn and they put a machine gun in front of the door and they had barns they'd put all these guys in. There were 9,000 of us in this camp. There were Americans, mostly Americans. There were Canadians. Australians and British, all airmen. You see, if you had a rank above a private, according to the Geneva Convention, they could not work you. But if you were a private, they could work you on anything, even you're not supposed to work more war materials, but that didn't seem to make any difference to the Germans. They needed work. So um, anyway, if you had to go out in the middle of the night, you would be accompanied by a guard. They didn't give us any kind of material to clean ourselves, so we'd take the best we can. Anyway, the next morning we get out and I saw something there that uh, stuck in my mind. The owner of the farmer that owned it, he met with the commandant of our camp was there and the first thing they do was Heil Hitler and then they shook hands. But there was about a five-year-old boy with the farmer's son. He also went Heil Hitler. And you should hear and see the smiles come from the German guards and the commandant. That was a great thing. They taught him young. So about the f four, you know, let's see, about the third day out, <clears throat> The machine gun, they would break it down, one guy would carry the barrel and the workings of it. And here's the guard that took my pack and threw it under, the, he's carrying this machine gun. And he's trying to get one of his buddies to take it and help him carry it, because it's heavy. So I worked my way over to him. He looked at me and I says, Nix Gavecht on the Eisenbaum. Well, that's the last I saw of the machine gun. We didn't have any machine guns after that. So finally, on the 10th of February is my birthday. I run into my radio operator, uh, and uh, he had a guy by the name of B.F. Potts from Louisville, Kentucky. They had hooked up. I said, Doug, why don't the three of us stick together? I says, okay, he says. So we marched in the afternoon and late. We marched until 10 o'clock at night. 
And then they turned us out into an open field at um, uh, it's a It's a port, is what it is. So I took my blanket and put one on the ground, and he took his and he put it over us, and we sat back to back. And I says, Dyke, you got anything to eat? Yeah, he says, I got one cold boiled potato. I says, it's my birthday today. <laughs> I was 20 years old. I never had a birthday party. Anyway, he says, I'll share that cold potato with you. So that's what we had. The next day, they put us on a barge, and they took us across to Panamundi. Little did I know at that time that this is where they were making the big, the, the v, V2 rockets were being made at Panamundi. But <clears throat> at a bombing raid, they pretty well destroyed it, and uh, they moved the uh, manufacture of V2 rockets down to Norden, Nordenhaus. And uh, there they, within just a matter of days, they were back in production. I mean, this um, Spears was his name. He was head of production in Germany. He sure knew how to get things going. Anyway, we marched and marched, and finally we got down to Falling Bostel. And there was an international camp. I think it was 11B or something like that. There was everything in there. There were Russians in there. There were uh, guys that, uh, prisoners that wore turbans and uh, from India. Everything was in there. And that's where I spent Easter. So we're there for a few days. We're sleeping in a tent. Otherwise, it was barns or sleep outside. And then they took us out and uh, they gave us, took us to a place and we had a shower. That was welcome. But I noticed in the shower, it had two sets of heads. Water came out of one and nothing came out of the other. Hmm, what's wrong? They must be plugged up. Well, they took our clothing and they run into an oven and they would kill all of the uh, lice and uh, uh, fleas. If we would take a rest sometime, we'd lay over a day while everybody took their shirts off and they would get into the seams and get, get rid of some of them little critters. The only time they really bothered me is if I got real war warm, to, warm in bed. Eh? You could feel them running around you. Well, anyway, then when we got our clothing back, there was this huge pile of shoes and a huge pile of clothing. I said, gee, I wonder what that's for. Didn't know what was going on yet. That was an extermination camp that we were in. Okay. So, and we go back to camp. The next thing, we're going to move again. So we asked the guard, where are we going? Well, they said they're going to take us up to Lubeck, which is a port on the Baltic Sea, just a little bit east of Denmark. And they're going to put us on boat and take us to Norway and hold us for hostage. OK, so we're going to go, gee, great, I'm going to get to go to Norway. So we get within two days of this march, when the whole total, we covered 520 miles. Anyway, in two days from uh, Lubeck, we get liberated by the British. And uh, the guards said, tomorrow your comrades will come. And all night we could hear artillery going. And uh, 9 o'clock next morning, two British uh, uh, soldiers on motorcycles came through and they said, you're, you're liberated now. OK, that's fine. They said, we got to keep moving. We're going to meet the Russians today. Anyway, that was the 2nd of May. Now, this thing about Lubeck and going on boats, on the either it is a National Geographic Channel or the Discovery or the History Channel, and stupid me, I didn't get a, a VHS. They used to sell those things, see? I thought, oh, well, that, that, this is, again. And this program was a documentary of recently declassified information. And it came on that 
the International Red Cross told the British High Command that the Germans had steamed up four of their luxury liners at Lübeck and they had 7,000 POWs aboard. About time this information got down to the RAF, it was 7,000 German troops going to go to Norway and fight the war from Norway. So they sent out Typhoon fighters to sink those ships, bomb them, and anybody in the water, they got to strafe. Mm -hmm. So they went there and they did that. And they strafed those in the water. Not only being strafed by these fighters, the typhoons, they were also run over by German PT, PT boats. Out of that 7,000, there were six survivors. They had three of them on, on, the, uh, tel on the documentary that could speak English, but they didn't say what country they were from. One of them said that he told about, the, they were down the hole, how the conditions were, they would bring the food down and the waste products would go back up in the same bucket. Anyway, the, sh the sh ship is sinking, and this one guy said he was down in the hole, and he got uh, on deck, and he ran into a young German SS officer. That is, was the Schusstoffler, it was called. That was Hitler's personal army. He says, as soon as he saw me, he drew his Luger, and he says, I thought he'd shoot me, but he put it to his head and killed himself. So I have this story, and my wife is telling me, I just want to go back and see that camp. I said, there's nothing there anymore. I said, the Russians took all the buildings, and there's nothing there. I know there's nothing there. Oh, well. Finally, I give in to City Hall, see? So we go over there. When was it? Uh, uh, 206? And 206, okay. So we go. Okay. So we go up to Barth, that's a Stalag Luft one, which I wasn't there, but somebody on the tour was there, so we went there. And leaving Barth, uh, uh, we picked up another passenger on our tour bus, and he introduced himself as a professor so and so. He had a, uh, a degree in, uh, he had a doctorate in uh, archaeology. Okay. He could speak very good English. In the meantime, I'm talking to Germans that could speak English. I want to know about these four ships. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. So I, I says to him, I says, can I run this story by you? So I did. He says, first of all, I want you to know there were no women or children aboard those ships. It was all prisoners of war and political prisoners. Out of those surviving six, he said that one is still living. He's over 100 years old. A German communist, he said, and you're still living. He says, yes, it is so. So now I'm trying to track it down to get this story because it's such a fantastic thing, but I can understand why it was classified. Because when they, they sunk the ship and 7,000 people were lost, you know, that, that doesn't look, didn't look good for the RAF. So anyway, um, uh, that, that was that story. We, we, um, the next, uh, after we were liberated, the next morning a farmer came with a, 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 a horses and wagon, and we were going to catch a ride to Lunenburg. So we're out about two hours on a horse and drawn wagon, and we come to a bunch of German vehicles that somebody had they'd abandoned, and of course the GIs had hijacked them, and, or whatever you call it. And, there was one truck that I looked into. It was cases and cases of medical instruments. Well, I ain't got any use of those. But I came across a typewriter, which is a royal typewriter, which I knew. Oh, gee, I used a typewriter, so I took the typewriter. And someone came to me and they said, you know, there's a school bus over there and got the keys in it. Well, I said, can you get started? <laughs> I don't know. So we went over there and sure enough, I got it started. So. I drove the school bus, never drove a school bus before. <laughs> and it was it come from Holland is where it was from. And on the way we got stopped by the British and he says, uh, how about giving you guys some, or some oranges? Oh boy, was that good. 
So we drove this thing and we got to the main road going into, Lube, uh, into Lubeck, uh, not uh, Lubeck, but uh, uh, this, uh, yeah, Lubeck. And anyway, we crossed the Luna River, but the Germans had blown up the bridge and they put a pontoon bridge across and all they were allowing was military and um, Lunenburg, that was the name of the town. And uh, the town uh, that we were liberated at was Wittenberg. Now, how many, some of you people may remember Paul Krul had the uh, fairway store? That's the town where he came from, Wittenberg. And uh, so anyway, we get to the main road and on each side of the road, as far as you could see, was German refugees. Every kind of a vehicle from a baby buggy on up they were pushing it, they're trying to salvage some of their very belongings. They were a way to get, get away from the Russians that they're, they're not letting them across the bridge. So we finally got the, uh, this uh, Lunenburg and uh, we got into town a little ways and here the British soldiers are taking swords out of a building and they had a big lorry or a big truck they were throwing them in. I says, gee, how about you guys want, want to get a sword? Yeah, so we stop, start taking the swords off this truck. They're dress swords. I, so I grabbed the hand, for, uh, and I, you put those back. He says, we got a lot of trouble just kidding. If you want some, go inside. In this building, I'm sure we could have filled a semi, uh, semi load of these dress swords. I have the sheath at home, but uh, the engraving on this says, how about that? 1910, 100 years ago. These are dress swords. Uh, they were stacked about so deep all over the place. But they said, all right, the British, what are you going to do with them? We're taking them out and burying them. <laughs> First they said, we'll run over with the bulldozer. So um, anyway, we got to a... Um, a place where they were processing POWs, which was an academy, a military academy. And uh, we got there, and of course they give us all you want to eat, and was, I made my, my mistake. I ate everything I could get my hands on. And I'm still carrying this typewriter. And one little British guy, he was bound and determined to get that typewriter. He just hounded me, hounded me. I'm eating, he wanted that typewriter, oh man. I said, I'm taking it home. Oh, you won't be able to take that home. 